I was talking about breeding cannabis for therapeutic benefits. Okay. Um, that's been kind of my go-to speech. I've been speaking with uh, Canagrow, I guess kind of before there was a Canagrow. They did the science of cannabis in Mesa, Arizona four years ago, I think it was. And uh, so I've spoken at pretty much every one of their events ever since. I like, I like that it's kind of a non advertisement based speaking engagement. I do some other speaking stuff. Also called pay to play. Right. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, like I went to Spanibus this year and spoke and the people that were speaking with me, it was like a sales pitch, right? And I was just there to educate. So I like coming to these kind of conferences where it's kind of expressly forbidden to advertise and, and do that. I, so. do. I mean, that's why every time I do these things, I'm like, please don't pitch your products. Like people just tune right out. They'd rather hear that you're smart on a topic and be like, I'm more curious about this person. Right. Like, I'd Well, like then they'll come up and ask you about it, right? right? Can I get a card? And yeah. yeah. But, but what was said? What so were you speaking on, Chris? I, go, go ahead. Go, oh, uh, I did the Cannabis Cultivation 101, um, and the subtitle was uh, Foundations of a Successful Grow Operation. So just went over the went over the basics. Can we scale up to the 202 and 303 advanced level courses and yeah. talk about the more advanced level stuff? Yeah, sure, okay. of course. So, so and you, you're, you both, you're a team, like you grow together. So you're both exploring, um, like we talked about before, kind of more minor cannabinoids and things that aren't being bred for now to see what therapeutic <coughs> benefit they may have. We started with CBD right. was the big one, and this was kind of pre-Gupta, pre-all of that. Yeah, so we okay. started with our CBD work quite some time ago. Before um it was called him. Right. And when the, the, what are the brothers in Colorado? Stanley Brothers, the, yeah. What do we think of the Stanley Brothers? Since they get all the, they're like the poster child for... I've heard enough, like, it's one of those things, like when we're talking about lights, like I don't want to defame anybody or put anybody <laughs> down, but... Uh, You're answering the question without actually answering the question. I didn't say anything. <laughs> um, you know, there's just stories that you hear within the community about how certain people treat other people and like where things are sourced from, where genetics come from and things like that. And you just kind of, I don't know them personally. So, and I've never seen their operation or worked with so, them personally. So when you were exploring CBD, like, cause not many people were like in tune with, there's this thing, CBD, like growers, right? No. Um, People were wondering why we were doing it because okay. you can't make money off of it because nobody's getting high. Right. <laughs> and you guys were like, we're going to stay the course. Yeah. yeah. And, and so. And so where we like, like, okay, we know this thing, CBD, we want to breed for it. Where are you sourcing the genetics from to start? All over the world. Okay. Yeah, everywhere we could find something to work right. with. Right. Back then you were, were looking at it. that you were like. There really wasn't. Okay. Um, you know, at that time is kind of when Canatonic was hitting the scene. So I would say that was the other like real major thing. Then you had two who's TSK out of Colorado and he was doing his uh, like um, Miggs County uh, railroad hemp crosses with some OG Kush kind of stuff. And that's your, your woo and your R4 kind of, that's where that came from. So there's like these little, little lights started lighting up and there was probably I mean, at that time, there was probably four people in the world outside of Israel that were really working on anything CBD centric. So it wasn't, it's, it's not like you could just go and buy CBD genetics, right? You had to look for it in different places. And, and the issue with that is the only way you're going to know beyond a shadow of a doubt whether a CBD in it or not are, are lab tests, right? And so labs, analytical testing labs in Oregon weren't really like popping up, weren't really a thing. You know, they had very limited, what was it, only like Sunrise for the longest time. Was it, what, are we Just talking one. like 10 years ago, seven years ago? Five. Five, okay. Yeah, I mean five years ago when we started getting really good data back on our plants, that's when like the labs really got their shit figured out, right? Um, up until that point, it was just kind of going based off effect there's a lot of cannabis in the world and not very much of it gets tested. Right. So right. you find CBD in places you don't expect to. Yeah. And that's where a lot of it's come from. Yeah. And so what, uh, like 
what are you exploring now? Like CBD was the first, and obviously now that's like this this <coughs> two star cannabinoids of John and Paul. Right. Yep. So who, who's George and Ringo of the cannabinoid world? They're all important, um, and they all have, and there's unknowns, undiscovered. One of the things I got to talk about in my speech is the first time my companies allowed me to share uh, data, like raw data, and we're finding everything from, you know, CBC is something we've been working really heavily on. We're showing great expression in CBC. Um, CBC is a neuroprotectorant and also has been shown to reverse some damage caused by neurodegenerative diseases. So that one's been really primary for us looking into based on some family histories and grandparents with Alzheimer's and stuff. It's it's an important one. So, I mean, it's, as far as that one goes, I feel like we've got that pretty, if not nailed down right there. Um, THCV, um, for people with diabetes, dietary supplements, things like that is something we're looking into. But what's interesting is we're doing these um, HPLC studies and looking at the things, we're coming up with a lot of spikes. There's, there's cur- commercially available standards, right? And this is kind of the, the notebook of what they say, here's the cannabinoids that are in cannabis. And if they haven't been able to say that this cannabinoid is this and they haven't done molecular ana- analysis on it and like gotten a reading on it and have been able to reverse engineer it and turn it into a standard then it just kind of gets swept under the rug and so far we have found nine unidentified spikes okay. so cannabinoids that don't have a standard for them so nobody really knows what they are there's and a limit, bottom limit to the testing so if there's you know an infinitesimally small amount of some cannabinoid in there it's Typical testing equipment can't even find it. Even so register. why would they make a standard for it? Nobody's going to buy right. it. It has to be commercially viable. <clears throat> but when we start talking about therapeutic doses of things, a lot of times those things, especially in conjunction with each other, do create a therapeutic dose in what you're using. So us and with the company that we're working with, we have a partnership agreement with the Texas Arlington the Shimatsu Laboratory there. And we're looking at uh, compounds down to the quadrillionth in the plant, so we can look at it really deep. And so we're so you're you're sending stuff to them to use kind of equipment that's next generation. To do right, stuff it's one of seven. Basically, to help you see. Right. <laughs> right, it's one of seven labs in the world that's able to do that. Okay. Um, and so we're going to quantify what these are, where they work, do some studies, see what they, how they affect the human body, and uh, try to figure out what they do and why they're important in the cannabis plant. So it's, it's hard to say, you know, I want to breed for this specific cannabinoid when this cannabinoid doesn't have a name, you know. Or, so the ones that we do know what they do, CBDVA, THCVA, and uh, CBC and CBCL and CBCT were doing very well on breeding higher concentrations of those into plants. Um, we're also doing a very good job of breeding unknown cannabinoids into plants. <laughs> so like we know it's something. Yeah, so we and, and we're it. seeing considerable spikes, like a pretty good surface area in the plant that is this cannabinoid. And you know, the way, the way you can really tell whether it's just a booger on the machine or a cannabinoid is through decarboxylation experiments. So we can decarboxylate them, we'll watch the acid fall off, it'll move positions, and it, it's telling us, you know, this is a cannabinoid, it's acting like a cannabinoid, so we need to have them reverse engineered. And So we're learning, we're learning a lot, but we're kind of pushing the envelope on what there is, and then it's not so, just... So, ba- so basically part of this is there is an equipment innovation or access to equipment that you didn't have yeah. even a year ago. Right. Yeah, um, in the past few months, five months, um, we've accomplished more with breeding than we have probably in our entire careers. Um, Just because of the amount of information and data we have, we can go through 100, 200 plants a day and get data on that many plants and I can just run just huge seed pops and run through everything and only pick out the interesting stuff and only work with that. Whereas before, maybe we had 20, 100 seeds of something and we pop it all out and you just roll the dice and hope the one that you pick was the one you were looking for, right? So the the jump in technology is huge. Um, 
and it really just streamlines our ability to just tear through plants and find exactly what we're looking for. So to iter iter iteratively produce, test, call, tweak. Right. Um, I can get pretty good readings on plants as soon as leaves get to maturity. So about seven sets of leaves, we can get a really good idea of where the synthases are dumping into the cannabinoids. And so I can cull by then so I can just cycle plants through well so what about like someone like a hope like how would you work with people like that why Drive she's so through? awesome to me is because she can park genetics right she can put a genetic in a state where it can sit and so that particular phenotype of that genotype i can put into a genetic storage and just because i don't need it right now doesn't mean that i don't want to hold on to it but the issue is is space so, we can't have 50,000 plants just sitting there that we're not growing. But if I can put it in a small little container and have it sit inside of a case, right, then I can start to justify that. We have tons of data stored, so we might as well have the genetics stored as well. So right. If there's something that right. doesn't look important now, but you know, how many times has it happened to either one of us that we don't have a genetic around anymore and for some reason down the road you find there's something unique or, or desirable about it. And, and it's gone. And it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> And also it's really important to, you know, cannabinoids are cannabinoids, THC is THC and CBD is CBD, but the effects and the medical value you're really getting from a lot of the plants may not even lie in cannabinoids. I mean, we're learning so much new about the flavonoids that exist in cannabis plants and the anthocyanins. And I was talking to someone like flavonoids get like no love compared no. to terpenes. And there's 10,000 naturally, 10,000 plus naturally existing flavonoids in the plant world. Cannabis has quite a few of them. Cannabis is also unique in that it has three flavonoids, um, canaflavin A, canaflavin B, and probably soon to be named canaflavin C, that are unique to the cannabis plant. And uh, ask somebody, what are the medical benefits of canaflavin A? Well, I was talking about <laughs> I was eating lunch with Frenchie and he was talking about uh, like half of the trichome is is a uh, it's some word that like we haven't really even explored. I'm totally blanking on what the word was, but I don't want to say ether because it's obviously that's like an word. ethyl alcohol. I don't even know what it is. Ethyl anyway, ethylene. Would that make sense? That that's. I mean, we do, we have done some terpene tests where we have, what's it, French show something, ethylene show up in it. Yeah, uh, in plant, ethylene's a uh, hormone. So that might be what he's talking about. Or that may not have totally done the work. <laughs> Frenchie just got back to me. Phenol, which makes up half the trichome head, is what he's talking about. And then uh, terpenes the same way, right? Terpenes have been a lot more researched. Um, so you can go to PubMed and look up a terpene and see what its medical benefits are. But finding unique terpene and flavonoid combinations in plants for specific uh, conditions and things like that. I think that and the cannabinoids that people aren't looking at are really what defines what a strain is and what it can do. And I don't think until people truly understand that part of it, you're just still gonna be on this, well, I want the stuff that tests 30% THC, you know, or I want the highest testing CBD plant there is when that's just a therapeutic dose of that's gonna be a therapeutic dose. It doesn't matter how much percentage is in the plant, it matters what's with it, you know, and it's really important for us to find those molecules, figure out what they do, trace them through the human body, how do they react with us, what is it doing for us, and then, that can help us with selective breeding processes to know that, okay, we want to build, we want to breed a plant that's high in this. So with hope, with the ability to store plants, maybe there's something I'm missing in a bunch of these plants and I don't want to throw them away um, because who knows when I want to go back to it. And it's a lot easier to save it when you have it than try to refine it. Cause a lot of times it's like a needle in 10 haystacks, you know? Right. So, so you guys are, you're breeding, but you're, you're also flowering out, like do you have a brand? Oh, we work for Zet Therapeutics. Okay. So we're a research and development company. Okay. And uh, so we do genetic breeding and then looking at all of the genetics and then 
Chris does a lot of the heavy lifting as far as like growing them out for phenotypical expression and finding what kind of lighting and conditions and how they grow best. And so Chris and I have been working can, together. Can you talk about some of that stuff? Like certain cultivars or I've noticed that they're better in this climate or with these lights or? I have, um, you know, mo most of my experience has been with THC. I've grown thousands and thousands of different THC cultivars. So I've definitely learned how they act in uh, different lighting and heating and environments and stuff. And now we're using some of those THC cultivars to cross in with CBD to uh, create hemp strains. But what we're going to be looking at is using different light spectrums um, to compare the test results to see what um, cannabinoid production we get using different spectrums. What are some of the current hypotheses? Well, uh, we know that UV is responsible for the creation of cannabinoids in the plant. <laughs> so, so like specifically UVB when put onto a plant in a higher concentration that is normal will increase your THCA production in the plant because THCA protects the plant from UVB. So that would be one example. Yeah, so applications of UV at different, freq or, uh, different intensities at different times. Um, would be one thing and then we'll experiment with, we want to experiment with more full spectrum uh, light that's outside the PAR range. Blue light, green light. <laughs> yeah, actually that, the, the Israeli guy who is two booths down from you guys, I was talking to him, I was like, what's kind of some more modern research, the, the new research, which is like green, like, because people always say, like, green doesn't do anything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, actually, it does. And then what do you what do you think green does? Oh, I don't know, but I want to find out. All right. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know that uh, a lot of the LEDs were have been missing the green spectrum in the past, and they've come a long ways now. But, no, we need some analytical uh, data, and so it'll be exciting to find out. It's right. something we've been wanting to do for a long time. Right. And... and not just lighting, you know, feeding, like what concentrations of, of different nutrients are you giving the plants? So what, what's your grow media? Do you have a standardized or is your outdoor, indoor, greenhouse all, are you soil outdoor and hydroponic indoor? We've always preferred soil. We think soil, as far as growing a smokable plant, grows the highest quality plant. Um, now, as you far as- beat, You can't beat the interactions that are happening with the plant in the soil. Same way you can't beat the light that comes from the sun because it's the plant has evolved to live in Earth, Earth's environment. So the closer we come to mimicking that. So, so your preference is to grow outdoors in soil. That would be your <sighs> well with sunlight All in soil. <laughs> yeah, but nobody wants to grow outdoors. No, I mean, greenhouse. I'm sure some people probably do. But yeah, right. Um, but you got to think of things, there's going to be interactions that are going to be missed. So flavonoids play a role in communicating between microorganisms in, in the root biome of the plant. So you can have a flavonoid that talks to, to these microorganisms and tells them we need more nitrogen and it'll increase nitrogen uptake. Well, how do you do that in a hydroponic system that doesn't have the microbes creating that, that web? Um, so you, I just feel like you miss out on a lot. I think you can grow some real good hydro smoke, but I think you're missing out on a lot of the things that people aren't paying attention to that really give the plant its like well-rounded, amazing effects and beyond that therapeutic and medical effects and benefits. So w one of the things I asked the light scientist guy, like w I, I was working at a nursery for a while in Carpinteria and we wanted to test supplemental, so it was greenhouse, but we wanted to test supplemental lighting on the mon stock and then kind of experimenting with like, are, would different parts of the color spectrum be conducive to like, you know, let's say you get 25 clippings a week from a mom, right? Could you, could you increase it to 30, 30, like, how much could you increase the, the number you could clip each week based on Sure. Something with light. Have you done right. any kind of research on that? We haven't yet. Right. Also, when you're talking about things like flavonoids and anthocyanins, they, uh, they're responsible for the nodular growth of plants, right? 
So if you're doing something that is setting off that, that chain reaction of uh, flavonoids in the plant that's creating nodular growth, and you can do that using light manipulation, yeah, absolutely. You could find the light spectrum that works with that, but like that's all, it's all a possibility, right? And until we really get into it and start looking at these different molecules, what reactions are causing them to appear and, and what functions they're serving in the plant, um, it's going to be hard to say, but it's all of these things we're talking about don't exist in the plant for human beings, right? THC, CBD, all the way down to the small things, they're all a function of the plant. And so it's doing something to help the plant grow or help the plant repel pests or help the plant bring animals in to eat them to spread the seed. You know, it's all part of the plant's processes to live. Um, and it just turns out that they have great, the side effect is they have great benefit to humans. So now it's putting the two pieces together of synergistically, well, if we can do this to the plant, we can manipulate it with this kind of nutrients or these kind of lights to make an extra expression of this or that in the plant, we can really kind of dial in grows to uh, specifically highlight and pull out higher levels of, of those, you know, terpenes and flavonoids and even can cannabinoids that we're looking at. And we're also going to do some experiments with uh, introducing different microbes to the root zone instead of are you targeting uh, specific microbes? Like we want to explore more. Well, yes, but there's a there's a there's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, there's just a lot of them. Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas and hmm. Is it beef up and nematodes? Yeah, um, there's uh, people on the market saying right now that certain uh, microbes are uh, uh, they're strepto. I forget which one. Uh, they're saying that they, yeah, streptomyces, that's the one, uh, increases CBD production and decreases THC production. So that's something we definitely want to play with and, and see it in our own hands because they're claiming pretty outrageous things. They are outrageous claims, but <laughs> it's very possible, you know. Until There's you probably a basis to the claim. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And so basically that would throttle one and almost put the gas on the other. Right. Well, THC, like I said, has to, like, this is a problem that we're having with hemp legislation, right? Is that THCA has to exist in the plant. THCA is a UVB protectorant, and 3% of all light from the sun is UVB. Without that protectorant, the sun will cook the plant and it will die. So the idea of, well, I've got a plant that tests non-detectable THC, do you? You know, it's in there, trust me, because it has to be. You know, as like a human being, you couldn't just be like, I don't like my white blood cells. I want to get rid of them. Like, good luck with that, right? <laughs> so um, trying to talk to them about, well, yeah, if your concentrations of all cannabinoids are very low, yes, maybe it'll come up non-detectable. But as you know, maybe you need 10 times more plant material to make the same amount of oil as this very high testing plant in CBD with a little bit more THC. But your oil's all going to come out around the same concentration of uh, THCA or THC Delta 9. You know, it's just the way that it is. It can't exist without it. Right. Yes, so everybody tell the USDA not to make testing, <laughs> hemp testing. Right now they're talking about making hemp testing after decarboxylation. So it, you'd be looking at all of the THCA that's not being considered THC by the government right now will be converted into Delta-9 and then tested. And that's going to make the 0 0.3 threshold um, unattainable for a lot, I mean, a lot of genetic, you know, maybe all genetics. Uh, so it's either going to come down to techniques like streptomyces, if that's what works, or nitrogen deficiency, if that's what works, um, or everybody calling and emailing the USDA and telling them not to make this decision, or what they really should do is test decarboxylated, but raise the threshold from 0.3 to 1 percent, or 0.7 or something that makes sense genetically. I, th I think I think one <laughs> yeah, percent. I, mean, I think 1% is a real solid number. I think, I think it that's is too. an achievable number by anybody. Um, I think so. Labs in Oregon that are ISO certified, like the highest level of certification to get for a lab. What do you think their uh, to continue that certification? What do you think that their error their error ranges, like percentage-wise, how much of an error can they have and still be considered an accurate test? I would assume under 10%. Plus minus 10%, correct. Direction, right? 
Yeah, right. So 5%. So 10, five, only 5 yeah, yeah. yeah, 10% window. We're talking about 0.3%. So you're telling me that the labs out there that have a 10% window of inaccuracy are going to be able to tell you that, oh, this is 0.3% on the nose? Like, like it's just, it's a ridiculous law to begin with. Um, the idea of segregating a plant out, cannabis, it's cannabis, and you're segregating it out and calling it hemp with a completely random number that somebody came up with that said, well, this. That's different in Europe and different in other countries. Right. right. And what, it's what's the European threshold? Point two is the European unions, and that's, well, I haven't actually read the law, but what we're being told is that's total THC. They, I don't think they discriminate between the THC molecules. So right. they have an even lower threshold, but up until uh, not that long ago, it was 1%, and they just changed it. So they went in the wrong direction. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, I think, it, like, I, I think it should US, be... We like where they're going. I think it should yeah. be done by ratio. Right. If a plant, let's say, is 20 to 1, 20 parts CBD to 1 part THC, and, in, and above, hemp, right? Because why are you going to fault somebody for well, growing it, a plant like better? Medicine has a certain amount of alcohol in it, right? Yeah. And you're not like why? But it's punishing people who grow plants better. Well, you know, if I grow my plant better and I get higher test results, that's going to take me outside of the range of legality. But somebody else can grow the same plant, fucking crappy, and get low test scores, and then that's fine. It's it's a it's a messed up system. <laughs> What's something that you guys have bickered about recently? Fox Farm. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, what's, what's the topic specific to? Adam loves Fox Farm um, soil. So for parking plants and getting them green and lush again, so there's like cheater things, right, that you can do and it is the path of least resistance to getting a plant back to health is just throw it in some ocean forest and give it four weeks and it looks beautiful again. Which is a and testament to Fox Farm. I'm not banging, <laughs> not banging Fox Farm. And I know <laughs> that it's like there's other ways to do it, but I'm very busy and I don't have time to mix all the soil. So if we want to bicker about it, as soon as he gets down to mixing up all the soil and making it right, then I, I won't have to use Fox Farm anymore. Chris and I don't really bicker no. about much. Um, about anything. No. Um, <laughs> You're very symbiotic. We we're are. We're just non-confrontational. Not, we're no drama people. Well, we've been together for a long time as partners, you know, and when we first got together, I think we kind of set... But set passionate intellectual discussions are healthy and good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but we're just always kind of on the same page about it. I know it sounds weird and I'm not trying to be like, things are perfect in our world, but like generally we try to go too many directions at the same time. So it's hard to like really focus on something, but it's rare that Chris and I even do much working together in the same space because we have so many projects going on, you know? So it's like, Adam, you handle this and I'm going to handle this. And it's, you know, his responsibility to do that part. It's my responsibility to do this part. And as long as neither of us fucking drops the ball, like, and we haven't, there's really nothing to bitch at each other about. And, you know, and we're great friends. And, you know, we've been friends for a long time now. And, yeah, it's, it's really, our relationship is as good as it sounds. Like, it's just, I could not have a better partner or person to work with. He grounds me in so many ways and keeps my feet on the ground and keeps me calm when I'm freaking out. I'm a super anxious person and, uh, you know, totally kind of the yin to my yang or whatever, you know, like it's, it's a really, it's also a symbiotic relationship, right? And I'm yeah, sure- Adam goes and does all the social stuff like talking on video and pressing palms and yeah. getting our names out there and uh but now I, and then i get to grow and but now i have to do too much it. of that stuff but well yeah. I've, I've drug him into it now yeah <laughs> right. i make him go to the speaking engagements like and stuff eating but. your spinach <laughs> uh well, who who give some love to like i guess some breeders that you respect 
for me, um, as far as like THC breeders, uh, Sunny Chiba, OD Diesel. Um, so that's Sunny Chiba's uh, Shane Yoakum. Yeah. Did like Purple Doja, Black Cherry Soda, things like that. Uh, OD Diesel's Raymond Bowser, Homegrown Natural Wonders. So like Mickey Kush, Doctor Who, things of those varieties. Those two guys really kind of like brought me into the fold of like con like contemporaries, breeders. Mm -hmm. um, just amazing dudes too, super nice. As far as like plug a seed into the soil and grow hot fire, Colin Gordon from Ethos has been killing it lately. Like his shit's super polyhybrid, whatever stuff. But I've never grown an easier plant from seed. It's just feminized comes up and it's fucking chronic. Like, so like as newer kind of breeders go, like he's a rad guy. And uh, Kyle Cushman or Adam Ornstein from High Times, Cushman's Cough really kind of like before i knew a bunch of people in the industry like really reached out and was like he's now a close personal friend of mine and well what's interesting is because he he's all indoor hydro right well, he uses vegematrix right? right which is vegan plant food um but yes i believe that he grows in a in a neutral medium yeah. So, so he's taking the seed and growing. So the first time I met way. the guy, right, we were in San Diego for a can of grow, and we were on the beach, and it's the first time I've met the guy. And like, so he comes up in his Kyle Cushman way, and he's like, "You grow with Vegematrix," and I'm like, "Nah." And he's <laughs> like, "Well, why not?" And I was like, "There's no bone meal in it." And he's like, "Well, yeah, it's vegan." And I'm like, "Yeah, I like bone meal." And so I kind of like shit talked him, right? And I think he liked that, <laughs> like you know, that like I just wasn't like, "Oh, Kyle Cushman." And then, like, you know, like, did things like invited me to his 50th birthday party in SoCal and went and hung with all the High Times guys. And just, he's a really nice guy. And I think he gets a little bit of hate in the industry. But, like, as a person, he's just an absolutely wonderful person. And then the, uh, the Spanibus crew for, like, kind of inviting me to Spanibus to speak and, like, just going to Spanibus was like a bucket list item to me. But when I was invited to speak yeah, at Spanibus, this year yeah, yeah. just I like go. melted me like i was just like oh my god it's so good but yeah those would be the people that like really that i respect and have much love for yeah and shout out to two yeah two <laughs> two's gonna hate me now yeah two or tsk um he is one of the, the seed company og cbd breeders in the country and you should record him sometime and ask him about the Charlotte's Web story and stuff because there's a lot of lot of information <laughs> there to dissect and look through. And but he is he's an amazing individual who really helped us with our path with CBD and our kind of collaborations together back at the beginning with CBD really pushed the envelope. How, how about Oregon growers? Mike Colley. <laughs> Mike Colley, Araya Love, uh, Andrew Campbell. So those are the guys at Geek Farms. Um, Geek Farms we're really impressed with. They're, they're not necessarily breeders, but they're breeding their own strains, and they're coming out with some great hot fire. Um, and they've got, they're finding really good genetics to make crosses with. That's stuff that hasn't really been around that much yeah. lately, I like guess you'd say. What are they exploring right now? Uh, that Crooked River Blues and the Oregon Indigo. Lots of stuff from the blueberry space is kind of what they started with. And then they kind of went into work with like, they really like like the lemon D, the sour lemon D, electric lemon G, those kind of strains. And but what they really do good is the grape uh, high chew. No, it's the uh, alpha oh, cut. Oh, I'm sorry, that's They do right. the alpha cut of the Doctor Who better than anybody in the world. Um, and their wheat is clean, their wheat is organic, it smokes down to a white ash, it's nice and calyxed out at the top with like the crack, it's, it's like perfect. And I'm a super snob and I've smoked weed from everywhere, it's the best fucking weed in the world. And I'm what, uh, what's publicly popular that frustrates you? Like why does everybody love that and keep buying it? Like as a strain or a product or? I mean, 27% hydro garbage. <laughs> <laughs> the dude that walks into the store. See, we've owned uh, clubs and dispensaries and recreational stores, and we've done everything. 
the dude that walks into the store and goes, what's your highest testing OG? Like that guy, that guy irritates me. Cause it's like, why? Well, that's what's gonna get me most high. Well, let me educate you, I don't want it. What's your highest testing OG? Well, I got 30% whatever OG, I'll take that. Okay, have a nice day. You know, like that's- Yeah, close mindedness. Yeah, not willing to listen to scientific data and to be educated and understand that THC percentage really means nothing in the grand scheme of how a plant's going to affect you. Right. Yeah, it's like a status symbol thing, right? You know, it's like- It's this one goes to 11. <laughs> right. If you can see, yeah, the numbers all go to 11. Look, right across the board, oh. 11, oh, 11, and most of 11, and then- Amps go up to 10. Exactly. <laughs> As far as genetics, nothing. I think all genetics have a place. You know, some plants get hate. You know, like everybody's like, fuck Blue Dream forever or whatnot. Oh, I just wore my Blue Dream shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I just feel like every genetic has, there, there's certain genetics I don't choose for me that I don't like, but I think every genetic's important. And I think it all tells a story and I think it all has its own value. Um, yeah, so there's not much hate. You know what I don't like? I don't like distillate pen tops. It's hot dog water and I don't like it. <laughs> Do live resin pen tops. They're good. <laughs> so like vape cartridges that are... Trash. There's a lot of trash vape cartridges out there. And a lot of people just, they're cheap, so they buy them, and they just don't know what they're missing out on. <laughs> uh, live resin, I think, is the best, you know? So a live resin extraction fresh off frozen, of right. fresh frozen extraction. I just think it just brings terp down, you know? You don't distillate with terpenes re-added, you know, it's like putting a bevita in your weed bag, it's the terp taker, right? It's just <laughs> taking away the flavor and wonderfulness of the weed. I don't like anything that that takes it much far away from its original intended botanical value, right? And so the more you mess with stuff and futz with it and clarify it and do everything, there's so many volatile compounds in the cannabis plant that you're just destroying but it's all for the almighty THC or the almighty CBD, right? But it's like, that's in everything. Like, who cares? Like, I want to see the, you know, I want to see your terps up at 20%, you know what I'm saying? Like, It definitely makes better medicine. <laughs>